Good morning, everyone. I hope you all are doing well today. It's Makeda Valletta, also known as the Body Scientist. Um, right now, I am live on my IG page, and I'm going to repost this video onto my YouTube page, The Body Scientist 81. So if you don't follow me on YouTube, be sure to follow me on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube and you don't follow me on IG, be sure to follow me on IG, okay? Um, so I'm just, um, you know, th this summer I haven't done a whole lot of videos because I've been busy living life. Um, so quickly, for those of you who are not familiar with me, I just want to let you know who I am. Um, my name is Makeda. I have a background in exercise and sports science um, and um, nutrition, trend and conditioning. I have a Bachelor of Science from the University of Delaware. Um, did graduate work at Columbia University, teaches college. And for those of you who are familiar with me, you know I talk a lot about the nutrition program, the graduate program that I was in um, at Teachers College at Columbia University. It was the only nutrition program in the country, okay, that did not take money from the food industry. So all of the nutrition programs in the, in the country are funded by the food industry, the same way all of the um, medical programs in the country are funded by the drug companies, okay? And they're really the same people, okay? They're really the same people. And think about it, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, right? So, um, and you know, so a lot of the things that you see me post on um, my Instagram page, if you look through my Instagram pages and you see the kind of food that I post and the food that I eat, um, you'll notice that I don't, you don't see me posting salads. You don't see me telling people, eat more green leafy vegetables. Um, I don't talk about vegetables much at all. And when I do, it's saturated, it's full of you know, fat, like spinach cooked in lots of butter. People are always saying that you know, Americans don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. But um, as I've traveled, okay, there's a lot of places in the world that I haven't been. The places that I have been outside of the country, um, like when I was in Europe, the, the healthiest, strongest looking people I've seen in the places that I've been have been in the Netherlands, okay? The white people and the black people in the Netherlands have beautiful skin. They look like they were ready for whatever, okay? They all look fit. They look like they could climb something right now. They look like they could skate somewhere right now. They look like they could do whatever. Um, and people in the Netherlands do not eat a lot of fruits and vegetables at all, but they eat a lot of meat and cheese, and meat and potatoes, and lots of cheese, right? Um, in Paris, they didn't eat a lot of vegetables, okay? So when I was in Paris, like, I feel like typically in, in the U.S. when you go out to eat and you get, like, chicken or something, it's going to come with a vegetable and it's going to come with a, um, a starch. That's typical in the U.S. Like, I almost feel like meals are unbalanced if I don't have a vegetable and a starch. But when I was in Paris, um, you know, they would give at a really nice restaurant, like, good chicken and mashed potatoes, no vegetable, okay? So I didn't see a lot of vegetable eating in Paris. Um, I probably saw more of it in London, and people in London look, did not look good to me. Um, when I was in Cuba, Cuba, they eat tons of pork, OK? Hey, hello to my South African friend. One day, when the borders open up, I'm going to make it to South Africa. Um, and I would like to know about South African food. I've been to a South African restaurant in New York, but I don't know a whole lot about South African food. So as I talk about this, um, as I go through this conversation, anybody from other places that want to add anything, please do. Um, so yeah, like in Cuba and Haiti, um, I went to Haiti 10 years ago, two months after the earthquake. And um, I had never seen such strong people in my life, okay? Such strong, well put together, well built people perfect bone structure, eyesight. Um, a lot of Haitians speak three, four languages, you know, so good brains. Um, um, I remember being in Haiti and seeing old women walking up mountains, okay, with like big old suitcases on top of their head. They're not even holding on to it. And I remember thinking, as a woman, I need to get my woman's skills up. <laughs> I remember other women that was with us, we felt that way because we're like, we can't walk up, I can't walk up that thing with that big old thing on my head and not fall, you know, not have it fall over. Very strong people in Haiti, okay? Lots of pork. Okay, so over the years, and if you look at my Instagram page, I constantly post books, okay? I post really, really good books because there's, there's so much nonsense out here. Um, almost everything that we get told by the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Society, the National Institutes of Health, all these health organizations is wrong. 
They tell people that cholesterol is bad for you. Um, they tell people that saturated fat and animal fats are bad for you. Um, sorry. None of that is true, right? And so there are many, many books that I post on my Instagram pages and I'm always recommending to people to look at if you really want to know the truth, right? So this is a book that I'm reading right now. The Big Fat Surprise, right? The Big Fat Surprise. Why butter, meat, and cheese belong on a healthy diet, okay? And this is written by, it's a, it's a New York Times bestseller. I highly recommend everybody read this. Every time somebody asks me, well, if, if, if cholesterol is good for you and if none of that is true, then why do we hear that and why do we get told that? And there's a short and a long answer to that, okay? It's something that I've been studying, what is this, 2020? About 17 years now. So I entered graduate school in 2003. That's when I became aware of all the politics. And this is the reason why I also re removed myself from my graduate program, because I wanted to tell people the truth. I wanted to really help people and tell them the truth. And the scientists that know the truth get silenced. They get shamed. They get ignored. And so when I was in graduate school, I, and I had been a practitioner, you know, I've been working with clients. You know, I started college in 99 start working with clients in 2000 and um, I was always researching because I wanted to make my clients better and healthier so when I was in graduate school I had clients with prostate cancer diabetes all kinds of issues right and so I'll always be researching and I knew smart people who are vegetarians and vegans people who I thought were intelligent um, so for years I didn't speak on my opinion on veganism instead I was just quiet and did research I was a graduate student at Columbia University so I had the access to whatever research I wanted to have access to. A lot of people quote studies, you know, um, like, oh, vegans live longer and uh, lean meat is better for you or whatever. People will quote these, um, you know, these, these so-called studies that they've never even read or dissected. And the thing about science, the whole thing about peer review is reading and dissecting and critiquing research. You don't just look at what somebody says the research says and go with that, you actually have to go look at it and analyze it. And when I did that as a graduate student, what I found was the research did not say that vegans and vegetarians live longer, that they were healthier. It did not say that anywhere, okay? That is not what I concluded. And as a practitioner working with clients over the years, I've had to revive so many people, okay? Men and women who have jacked up their body and their metabolism on those diets. I can't tell you the amount of women I've worked with who've messed up their kids, particularly their sons, okay? I know a number of women whose sons were developmentally, you know, they were slow developmentally. Be, and, and the mother was on a vegan diet when she was pregnant, giving the kid that diet as a, as a kid. And I've worked with people who fed, you know, took my advice and fed their, 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 their kids more whole, listing healthy animal foods and those kids were stronger than the ones that didn't okay so I've seen it in my own practice now in this book um, I don't know how to pronounce her last name the author's name is Nina I'll call her Nina T because I don't know how to pronounce her last name um, but um, with this book you know it, it goes through which is stuff that I've known for a long time it goes through a lot of the politics of scientific research how do we end up thinking that cholesterol was so bad. Well, it came from a man named Ansel Keys. You can look this up on YouTube. You can put in the cholesterol myth, okay? You can put in Ansel Keys, the cholesterol myth. You'll find tons of doctors and scientists talking about the bad and faulty research that um, it was done and that the scientific community ran with to say that cholesterol was bad for us. And that really when you look at the science, people with low cholesterol are way likely to die, way more likely to die of a heart attack than people with high cholesterol. Cholesterol is really not an indicator of whether or not you, how susceptible you are to heart disease, except for the fact that when it's way too low, you're way more likely to have a heart attack. Cholesterol is an antioxidant. And I have a YouTube video where I talk about that, but there are other people who talk about that as well. So when I say these things, I'm not the only one. There are other scientists and PhDs and doctors who say this too, which is not a lot. Because most people are too brainwashed and don't know how to think for themselves. But there are, there are tons of varied studies where when Ansel Keys, um, he's the man that came out with the cholesterol hypothesis. 
trying to say that high cholesterol is linked to heart disease. And in, anybody who analyzed his research criticized it and talked about how he selectively omitted all of the countries that any data that didn't go along with what he was trying to prove, he omitted it. And that's cheating in science. If you actually took all the data points in his research, you would see there was no correlation. I mean, there was no, okay. So in science, in science, correlation does not equal causation, okay? So what that means is that just because there's a correlation doesn't mean it's the cause. So for example, you could have, you know, a lot of black people that live in a certain part of town. And there could also be a lot of cancer in that part of town. So somebody says, okay, you have a lot of cancer and a lot of black people in this part of town. So that means the black people are, you know, causing the cancer to happen, right? Yeah. Oh, that's fine, that's fine, we'll take it. Or, uh, let me think of another example. Um, you could have a lot of people um, in a certain town who drink soda, right? Like, so, so, so you could have a town where um, people fall a lot when they're skating. So maybe people fall a lot when they're skating and was one particular town, but then in this town, people also drink a lot of soda. So then somebody could say, oh, the, the soda is the reason why people fall on the skates. And it's not. It just so happens that there's a bee in my face. See, I'm, ooh. I'm sitting in my neighborhood in Chicago where there are lots of bees, lots of bunnies, and lots of butterflies. The bee is all in my tea. Come on. This bee likes my tea. Hold on. Sorry. So just because a lot of people fall in this town when they're skating, and there's a lot of soda drinking in this town, it doesn't mean that people are falling because they're drinking soda, right? It's just a correlation. It doesn't mean it's the cause. This is something that's widely understood in science. Um, and a lot of scientific data is manipulated, right? And this is the reason why I left my graduate program, because I really wanted to help people. And when I started seeing the politics of scientific research, how the scientists, when they speak up, scientists who, who speak up about the truth, who have alternative viewpoints, and they get silenced and dismissed, and a lot of scientists die depressed and broke. Um, and then as a practitioner, if I would have worked in a hospital as a dietitian, I also wouldn't be able to tell people the truth. I would have to tell people what the American Dietetic Association says I can tell people, which is a bunch of bullshit, okay? It's not the truth either. And there are a lot of lobbying companies and food companies, I mean lobbyists and food companies who play a huge role in this. And so, like I said, there are several books, like the book Food Politics, um, written by Marion Nestle. That's a book that you must check out, which really gets into that. But um, this book, okay, I'm gonna read you some excerpts from this book because this book does a very good job, as does a woman named Sally Fallon. Um, you could check out a video on YouTube called The Oiling of America, um, written by Sally Fallon, which, um, I mean, I'm sorry. It's a video, it's a lecture called The Oiling of America by Sally Fallon. But Sally Fallon also has tons of books she's published, which I also recommend. They're all high, you know, highly researched. So, okay, so I'm gonna read you a couple things because this is talking about, there are many, there are many um, scientists who traveled to Africa and Asia in the 1800s and the early 1900s who observed people who were consuming nothing but milk, meat, and blood. They had very low cholesterol no heart disease, no signs of degenerative disease, lived to be very old. And at that same time in the U.S., there was epidemics of problems. You know, there was, there was more health issues and they weren't eating that way. Um, and so there's a lot of flaws with the research. It's just a very good book. So I'm just going to read a couple of... Um, also, what we know about the Mediterranean diet is incorrect, right? So I'm going to read some, so, uh, some, some things out of this book that's going to... Um, clear this up a bit and um, like I said you should check out the books that I post on my pages that I recommend okay because I don't be reading no bullshit okay so let me go back to see where I'm gonna start hold on give me one moment okay okay so I'm just gonna read you guys a moment okay hold on. 
Okay. In, in, in 1906, I can't pronounce this man's name, um, Wilhelmer Stephenson, the son of Icelandic immigrants to America and a Harvard-trained anthropologist, chose to live with the Inuit in the Canadian Arctic. He was the first white man these Mackenzie River Inuit had ever seen, and they taught him how to hunt and fish. Stephenson made a point of living exactly like his host, which included eating almost exclusively meat and fish for an entire year. For six to nine months, they ate nothing but caribou, followed by months of exclusively salmon and a month of eggs in the spring. Observers estimated that some 70 to 80 percent of the calories in their diet came from fat. It was clear to Stephenson that fat was the most favored and precious food to all the Inuit whom he observed. The fat deposits behind the caribou eye and along the jaw were most prized, followed by the rest of the head, the heart, the kidney, and the shoulder. The leaner parts, including the tenderloin, were fed to the dogs. Quote, the chief occasion for vegetables with most Eskimos was famine, wrote Stephenson in his controversial 1946 book, Not by Bread Alone. Recognizing how shocking a statement this would be, Stephenson added, if, if meat needs carbohydrate and other vegetable additives to make it wholesome, then the poor Eskimos were not eating healthfully. Worse, they spent months in the near complete darkness of winter, idly, unable to hunt with no real work to be done. They should have been in a wretched state, but to the contrary, they seemed to be the healthiest people I had ever lived with. He witnessed neither obesity nor disease. Nutrition experts of the early 20th century did not emphasize the importance of eating fruits and vegetables nearly as much as they do today. Okay, so moving forward, in 1928, um, Stephenson and a colleague, under the supervision of a highly qualified team of scientists, checked into Bellevue Hospital in New York City, and they vowed to eat nothing but meat and water for an entire year. So there was a, 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 a storm of protest. Oh, this freaking bee. Hold on a minute. I'm sorry. This bee is like trying to pollinate my tea. It won't get away. Shit. Oh, my God. Go oh, away. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, so this, this scientist, um, you know, they, they checked into Bellevue Hospital in New York City, and they vowed you nothing but meat and water for a year. A lot of people were protesting, saying that, you know, they were going to get sick and yada, yada, yada. So after some, hold on a minute. Okay, so after some three weeks on the diet, during which they underwent a constant battery of hospital tests. The still healthy men were released to their homes under close supervision. During the ensuing year, Stephenson fell ill only once when experimenters encouraged him to eat only lean meat without the fat. The symptoms brought on at Bellevue by an incomplete meat diet, which is an incomplete meat diet, lean, oh, sorry, an in, incomplete meat diet is is meat without the fat, okay, because meat needs fat. You don't want to eat lean meat. That's another thing. Lean meat is really bad, so the fat is super important. So um, during the ensuing year, Stephenson fell ill only once when experimenters encouraged him to eat only lean meat without the fat. Um, the symptoms brought on at Bellevue by an incomplete meat diet came on fast, diarrhea and a feeling of general baffling discomfort he recalled, and were quickly cured by a meal of fat sirloin steaks and brains fried in bacon fat. At the end of the year, both men felt extremely well and were found to be in perfect health. Half a dozen papers published by the Scientific Oversight Committee recorded the fact that scientists could find nothing wrong with them. The men were expected to con contract scurvy, at the very least, since cooked meat is not a source of vitamin C, yet they did not probably because they ate the whole animal, including the bones, the liver, and brain, which are known to contain the vitamin, okay? For calcium, they chewed bones, just as the Inuit did. Stephenson followed this diet for not only for the year of this experiment, but pretty much his entire adult life, okay? So now, across the globe, half a century later, George Mann, a doctor and professor of biochemistry who had traveled to Africa, had a similarly counterintuitive experience. 
Although his colleagues in the U.S. were lining up in support of an increasingly popular hypothesis that animal fats cause heart disease, in Africa, a man was seeing a totally different reality. He and his team from Vanderbilt University took a mobile laboratory to Kenya in the early 1960s in order to study the Maasai people. Man had heard that the Maasai men ate nothing but meat, blood, and milk, a diet like the Inuits composed of almost entirely animal fat and they considered fruits and vegetables fit to be eaten only by cows. Let's go back. They considered fruits and vegetables fit to be eaten only by cows. Mann was building upon the work of A. Gerald Shaper, a South African doctor working at a university in Uganda who had traveled further north to study a similar tribe, the Samburus. A young Samburu man would drink from two to seven liters of milk each day depending on the season, which worked out on average to be, was worked out on average to be well over a pound of butterfat. His cholesterol intake was sky high, especially during periods when he would add two to four pounds of meat to his daily diet. Man found the same with the Maasai. The warriors drank three to five liters of milk daily, usually in two meals. When milk ran low in the dry season, they would mix it with cow blood. Not shrinking the meat, they ate lamb, goat, and beef regularly, and on special occasions on market days when cattle were killed, they would eat four to 10 pounds of fatty beef per person. For both tribes, fat was the source of more than 60% of their calories, and it all came from animal sources, which meant that it was largely saturated. For the young men of the warrior Moran class, man reported that no vegetable products were taken, no vegetables, okay? Despite all of this, the blood pressure and weight of both these Maasai and the Samburu peoples were about 50% lower than their American counterparts. And most significantly, these numbers did not rise with age. Quote, these findings hit me very hard, end quote, said Shaper, because they forced him to realize that it was not biologically normal for cholesterol, blood pressure, and other indicators of good health automatically to worsen with aging as everyone in the U.S. assumed. In fact, a review of some 26 papers on various ethnic and social groups concluded that in relatively small homogenous populations living under primitive conditions, quote, more or less undisturbed by their contacts with civilization, end quote, an increase in blood pressure was not a part of the normal aging process, okay? And then it talks about how, you know, one scientist tried to say, oh, maybe they have, they have, a, maybe they have a genetic defect, and, but that makes them, you know, their blood pressure and cholesterol unable to go up. But when the Maasai, there are Maasai who moved to um, a neighboring country and they, they weren't eating their traditional diet and they did have problems with their heart and cholesterol. So it showed it wasn't genetic, it was um, their diet. Somebody asked me what I'm reading from. I said in the beginning, The Big Fat Surprise, this book right here. New York Times bestseller, okay? Okay. Um, if our current belief about animal fat is correct, then all the meat and dairy these tribesmen were eating would have caused an epidemic of heart disease in Kenya. However, man found exactly the opposite. He could identify almost no heart disease at all. He documented this by performing electrocardiograms on 400 of the men, among whom he found no evidence of a heart attack. Shaber did the same test on 100 of the Samburu and found possible signs of heart disease in only two cases. Mann then performed autopsies on 50 Maasai men and found only one case with unequivocal evidence of an infection, of an infarction, an, um, infarction, sorry, which is a heart attack. Nor did the Maasai suffer from other chronic diseases such as cancer or diabetes. Okay. But the first point on the USDA dietary guidelines is the increase vegetable and fruit intake. People in America think, oh, salad is so healthy. Like I said, you never see me eat salad. I stopped eating salad years ago. I feel like when I eat salad, I feel like I'm eating paper, okay? And when I travel around the world, I don't see people eating salad. I didn't see people eating salad in the Netherlands. I didn't see people eating it in Paris. <laughs> like, I don't see people eating it in Cuba. I didn't see people eating it in Haiti. Mexicans, you know what I'm saying? Like, only time you see people have salad, they're trying to appeal to Americans. And it really comes from a privileged white American place, anyway. Because you're supposed to be eating local foods, and foods that are in season. You know, 
most of the people, you know, living in the U.S. eating salad, that's not from a local environment and it's not in season, you know. Also, you get more nutrition from vegetables when you cook it. Like, I love Ethiopian food. Ethiopians don't eat raw vegetables, but you know what they do eat? Raw beef. But yet you have people in Jamaica talking about they're eating an Ital diet, Rastas, obsessed with Ethiopians, but then they're on a vegan diet. Ethiopians are not vegans, they eat raw beef, baby. Okay, and they don't eat raw vegetables. All the vegetables that Ethiopians eat is mashed up, you know, um, and cooked. And then people will say that, um, people will say that a lot of Africans can't drink milk. That's not true either. Because I know tons of, I, I know I have Nigerian friends that grew up drinking milk. I talk about this in one of my milk videos. You know, I have a Nigerian friend, grew up in Nigeria, grew up drinking milk. And um, he lives in California now, still drinks milk, regular milk. I had to tell him about raw milk. And if you don't know about raw milk, check my raw milk videos. Um, but he's tall, perfect eyesight, perfect bone structure, perfect teeth, perfect everything. He's tall, he's perfectly formed. And I know a lot of Africans like that. Cameroonian friend of mine, same thing. She grew up in Cameroon, grew up drinking milk. So this idea that Africans can't drink milk, I don't know where that came from because I know tons of Africans that drink milk. And where I live in Chicago, my neighborhood in Chicago, is full of East Africans and West Africans. And I see them walking with gallons of milk from the regular supermarket all the time. That's not true. Um, okay, so let me, let me find something else. Okay, so now, as it turns out, I'm skipping around in the book, right? As it turns out, many healthy human populations have survived mainly on animal foods historically and into the present day. It's easy to find examples. This bee is back again. In the early 1900s, for instance, Sir Robert McCarson, McCarrison, the British government's director of nutrition research in the Indian Medical Service and perhaps the most influential nutritionist of the ha first half of the 20th century, wrote that he was deeply impressed by the health and vigor of certain races there. The Sikhs and the Hunzas notably suffered from, quote, none of the major diseases of Western nations, such as cancer, peptic ulcer, appendicitis, and dental decay, end quote. These Indians in the North were generally long-lived and had good physiques, and their vibrant health stood, quote, in marked contrast to the high morbidity of the other groups in the southern part of India who ate mainly white rice with minimal dairy or meat. Okay? So, um... McCarrison believed he could rule out causes other than nutrition for these differences because he found that he could reproduce a similar degree of ill health when feeding experimental rats a diet low in milk and meat. The healthy people McCarrison observed ate some meat but mostly an abundance of milk and milk products such as butter and cheese, which meant that the fat content of their diet was mainly saturated. And everybody who knows, I eat tons of milk, I drink. I get my raw milk from, the, from a Russian Amish market in Chicago. I get my raw milk delivered to me by Muslims in New York for over, over 15 years. Chicago, the nation of Islam also has raw milk. I've never gotten it from them. I get it from an Amish market that's owned by Russians, okay? You go to Philly, the Amish, you can find raw milk everywhere. The Russians, Amish Muslims, they always got raw milk, right? Um, and tons of people drink it who, around the world. So some of the healthiest populations, right? Okay. So, um, meanwhile, the Native Americans of the Southwest were observed between 1898 and 1905 by the physician turned anthropologist. I can't pronounce this name. This is like, this is some kind of foreign name <laughs> that I cannot pronounce. So, let me, I'm going to call him. Alice H, okay, because I don't know how to pronounce his name. I don't even know what language this is that I'm looking at. Okay, so let me go back. Okay. Meanwhile, the Native Americans of the Southwest were observed between 1898 and 1905 by the physician turned anthropologist Alice H, who wrote up his observation in a 460 page report for the Smithsonian Institute. The elders among the Native Americans he visited would likely have been raised in a diet of predominantly meat, mainly from buffalo until losing their traditional way of life. Yet, as H observed, they seem to be spectacularly healthy and live to a ripe old age. The incidence of centenarians 
among these Native Americans was according to the 1990 U.S. Census, I mean, sorry, the 1900 U.S. Census, 224 per million men and 255, I mean, sorry, let me go back, sorry. The incidence of centenarians among these Native Americans was according to the 1900 U.S. Census, 224 per million men and 254 per million women, according to the three and six per million among men and women in the white population. Although H noted that these numbers were probably not wholly accurate, he wrote that no error could account for the extreme disproportion of centenarians observed. Among the elderly he met of age 90 and up, not one of those, not one of these was either much demented or helpless, okay? So you hear about this with Native Americans. There were so many centenarians and they weren't helpless and they weren't demented. And there are plenty of primary documents for when the, the colonizers and the missionaries came to the U.S., you know, came to North America, came to the Caribbean, came to South America, and they talked about the state of the indigenous people, how people in their 90s, hold on a minute, oh, I've got to sit back on this chair. How people in their 90s were only slightly weaker than people in, they were like 18, you know, they, they didn't have bad eyesight, they weren't crippled, they didn't have all these problems that people think is normal of, of, of old age these days. And also, when people say we live longer now than we ever did, that's not true. None of that is true. People were living longer before, and people were healthier, and they had less problems. People now are so sickly, and we think that's normal, okay, and it's not. Um, H was further struck by the complete absence of chronic disease among the entire Indian population he saw. Malignant diseases, he wrote, if they exist at all, that they would do um, that they do, I'm sorry, malignant diseases, he wrote, if they exist at all, that they do would be difficult to doubt. Most must be extremely rare. He was um, told of tumors and saw several cases of the fibroid variety, but never came across a clear case of any other kind of tumor, nor any cancer. H wrote that he saw only three cases of heart disease among more than 200 Native Americans examined and not one pronounced incidence of arteriosclerosis, which is um, buildup of plaque in the arteries. Varicose veins were rare, nor did he observe cases of appendicitis, peritonitis, ulcer of the stomach, nor any grave disease of the liver. In Africa and Asia, explorers, um, co colonialists, and missionaries in the early 20th century were, report, were repeatedly, repeatedly struck by the absence of degenerative disease among isolated populations they encountered. The British Medical Journal routinely carried reports from colonial physicians who, through experienced in diagnosing, I'm sorry, though experienced in diagnosing cancer at home, could find very little of it in the African colonies overseas. And, um, So few cases could be identified that some seem to assume that it does not exist, wrote George Prentice, a physician who worked in southern and central Africa in 1923. Yet if there were a relative immunity to cancer, it would be attributed to the lack of meat in the diet, he wrote. The Negroes, when they can get it, eat far more meat than the white people. There is no limit to the variety or the condition, and some might wonder whether there is a limit to the quantity. They are only vegetarians when there's nothing else to be had. Anything from a field mouse to an elephant is welcomed. I mean, I could just go on and on. Oh, but the thing is, hold on, let me, let me read this. Um, pre preferentially, okay, hold on. I'm gonna stop reading your ears off in a second. Um, So, I'm just jumping around, right? So an additional flaw in these studies was that they assumed that early human beings ate mainly the muscle flesh of animals, as we do today. By meat, they mean the muscle of animal, the loins, ribs, flank, chuck, and so on. Yet, focusing on the muscle appears to be a relatively recent phenomenon. In every history on the subject, the evidence suggests that early human populations preferred the fat and viscera. The viscera is also the organ meats, right? Of the animal over its muscle meat. Stephenson found that the Inuit were careful to save fatty meat and organs for human consumption while giving leaner meat to the dogs. 
In this way, humans ate as other large meat-eating animals do. Lions and tigers, for instance, first ravage the blood, heart, kidneys, livers, and brain of the animals they kill, often leaving the muscle meat for vultures. These viscera tend to be higher in fat, especially saturated fat. Preferentially eating the fattest part of the animal and selecting animals at the fattest point in their life cycle appear to have been consistent hunting patterns among humans throughout history. For the Bardi tribe of Northwest Australia, for example, researchers found that fat was the determining criteria of hunting fish, turtles, and shellfish. The Bardi people had developed an, extremely knowledge, uh, an extraordinary knowledge of the proper season and technique of hunting in order to satisfy what researchers deemed their obsession with fatness including the ability to detect the fatness of green turtle at night from nothing more than the smell of its breath when it popped up for air. Okay, that's how connected they were to their environment, okay? Flesh that lacked fatness was considered rubbish and too dry or tasteless to be enjoyed. Meat consumed without fat was commonly understood to lead to weakness, okay? The Inuit avoided eating too much rabbit because as an observer in the Arctic wrote, if people had only rabbits, they would probably starve to death because these animals are too lean. Okay, now, Ansel Keys, like I said, now, there's, there's another book called Nutrition and Physical De Degeneration by Weston A. Price. I talked about that book. Um, I'm, I'm going to start doing YouTube videos that are book reviews um, because I've been trying to tell people to read these books, but I'm going to start doing book reviews. And sometimes I've been wanting to do like a book club based on health and nutrition books um so if any of you have any suggestions of how i can do that or how i should do it please feel free to let me know because I, I i want to do a study group because i've been studying this stuff for so long and i'm as a nutritionist i'm always trying to educate my clients but it's so much work because people are so brainwashed and there really is so much um of the truth out there people just people oh god Ugh. People just listen to the popular people and the popular things, and they don't really dig deep. And in people's defense, I know it's a lot. This is my field. Um, and this is the reason why I don't respect people like Sabi, okay? I don't call him Dr. Sabi because he wasn't a doctor. He was a fraud. I felt the way when he was living, and I felt the way when he died. Sometimes you have to observe the obvious, right? Sabi never looked healthy. He looked frail as fuck. Okay, he had no glow to his skin. Healthy people have, who have life force and chi, they have a glow to their skin, okay? Sebi looked dry and ashy. He had no glow to his skin. He was so emaciated and weak looking. He did not look strong at all. And then he dies, he wasn't even that old, okay? I don't even think he made it to 85. Everybody in my family lives longer than that. People that lived in the damn earthquake in Haiti and live longer than that. Okay, and they didn't die from pneumonia. So he died from pneumonia in jail. People are like, oh, he was poisoned. He was in jail. People didn't. People people didn't live through slave ships from one side of the freaking world to another and didn't die of pneumonia. You know what I'm saying? Like people who die of pneumonia already have severely compromised immune systems. Okay, and you know what? You have a severely compromised immune system when you're on a starvation diet, eating fucking twigs and leaves like Sabi was. Okay, him being in Honduras. Mad people in Honduras live longer than he lived, and they were strong, physical, doing work. I have a friend who's Honduran. His father is older than Sebi. He'd be doing physical labor all the time, and he looks strong. Okay? So I don't respect people. Like, all of that stuff that Sebi was talking was bullshit. I have a YouTube video um, called Dissecting Sebi Suedo Science. Um, you can check it out where I break that down. But if you just read the books that I read, like, Sebi never even spoke about the importance of probiotics, okay? He never spoke about the importance of bone broth, you know, all that stuff. And the stuff that he was talking about was a bunch of made-up bullshit. Anybody who understands basic biology and physiology and how the human body works understood that that was not true. But unfortunately, to a lot of black people in America, all somebody got to do is throw some Afrocentric name or theme behind some shit, and everybody thinks they know what they're talking about. And I really, I have, a, I have um, another YouTube video talking about Afrocentric veganism and the vegan eating disorder. And I'm talking about that. Like, how these Afrocentric black people in the U.S., Afrocentric, I have to put in quotes, in the U.S. who be on this vegan shit when ain't no Africans on goddamn vegans. They're not. Have you ever spoken to Africans about what they eat? Because I have African friends from different countries, and they ate all kinds of organ meats. They eat insects. You know, they drink milk. They definitely ain't sitting around eating goddamn salads, okay? 
And please name a country. Please tell me what Asian country, what European country, what country in the Americas, in the Polynesian Islands, where you could go there and somebody's grandmother's gonna give you salad. That's not what people eat. And that's why I loved Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown because as he traveled around the world, in the eight traditional foods, nobody ever gave him salad, but you know what they did give him? Lots of pork. Everywhere, pork seemed to be like the number one meat eaten around the world. Everywhere he went, people gave him pork unless it was a Muslim country, okay? And um, I'm on fire now. Like, I'm always studying and posting things, but I'm going to have to start doing more YouTube videos, okay? So definitely share my videos because I don't get paid for them. They're all free, you know? Um, so sharing is caring for your information. Um, okay, so one of the things about Ansel Keys, um, um, so you got to check this man out. Ansel Keys in the... Um, cholesterol hypothesis and the cholesterol myth definitely check get away definitely check that out um hold on there's something else i wanted to find in here about some of the research that keys did when he was yeah ansel keys a-n-c-e-l keys yes he's the one that came up with the cholesterol hypothesis that cholesterol causes heart disease which is totally not true so if you go on YouTube and you look up the cholesterol myth, there's even a book written by a medical doctor called The Cholesterol Myth. People talk about how flawed Ansel Keys' research was and how he came to, to, to brainwash the whole freaking nation with this shit, right? Through force. And this book clearly documents it as well, right? And as does um, Sally Fallon. So, um... So this whole idea that cholesterol and saturated fat is bad comes from Ansel Keys, but I wanted, I'm trying to find, hold on a minute, um, the, um, with the, hold on a minute, okay, this, what he did in Greece and Italy, um, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, okay, okay, here we go. Now, let's get ready for this. So people think about the Mediterranean diet, which is wrong. Okay, hold on. Where are we going? Okay, so... The results... I'm just jumping in a random place. Um, oh, hold on. Sorry, 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 sorry. I have to go back. Okay. Okay. Okay, this is the seven country study, which which people talk about a lot. I'm trying to find the right place. Um, okay, I'm just gonna start from the beginning. Yes, yes, it's the Lala. He eliminated certain countries from the final results. Yes, he did. He totally manipulated his data. So I'm just gonna read a little bit about this. Um, I mean, his his research was horrible. Okay, and a lot of people have talked about it. So the seven country study. Unlike the earlier international sampling that Keyes had done on his travels with Margaret, the seven country study was the first multi-country epidemiological undertaking in human history. By standardizing the data collection and using on the ground surveys of sample population, Keyes aimed to amass accurate and detailed data that could be compared across nations, unlike those slippery national statistics, and thus settled the debate about diet and coronary disease once and for all. Keyes launched the study in 1956 with an annual grant from the U.S. Public Health Service of $200,000, then an enormous sum of money for a single project. He planned to follow the, in details some 12,700 12, middle-aged men in mostly rural populations in Italy, Greece, Yugoslavia, Finland, the Netherlands, Japan, and the U.S. A number of cr critics have since pointed out that had Keyes taken the critiques of Yersholami to heart, I can't pronounce that name, another scientist, he might have selected a European country to challenge his fat hypothesis, like Switzerland or France or Germany or Norway or Sweden. Instead, he chose only those nations based on national statistics that seem likely to confirm it, right? So when you do research, when you do research, you're not, sorry, it's loud. You're not supposed to just choose 
to research things that confirm what you're trying to prove. You want to, you have to be broad, okay? You have to have a look at things that counteract what you're trying to prove, okay? And you need to look at it wholly. He didn't do that. Since the early 20th, 20th century, investigators have known the importance of avoiding bias on the part of the investigators by selecting subjects in a random way. This is called randomize, randomization, and researchers follow protocols to achieve a random sampling. The key selection criteria could not be called random. Instead, as he wrote, he chose places that he thought showed some contrast in rates of diet and death, and even more importantly, places where he found enthusiastic help meaning both people and resources to conduct the study. Keyes just had a personal aversion to being in France and Switzerland, is what he said, right? Okay, so the historical period of the seventh country study was also a problem. The years that it, that it encompassed from 1958 to 1964 were a time of transition in the Mediterranean region. Greece, Italy, and Yugoslavia were still recovering from World War II, which had brought about extreme poverty and near starvation and Italy was all also emerging from 25 years of suffering under a fascist government. Hardship led 4 million Italians to flee the country and at least 150,000 Greeks to leave theirs. These are facts that should give a researcher pause, okay? Especially when you're studying food and nutrition, okay? Keyes might have asked himself whether in dipping into Europe of the 1960s, he might be getting an anomalous picture. Hold on. The people he studied were in a moment of deprivation. They would have eaten a richer diet in childhood before the war, as would have their mothers during pregnancy. Since some researchers believe that the tendrils of heart disease might be laid down in the womb or are an accumulation of lifelong habits, then a 1960s sampling was indeed a risky thing. It was clearly not reflective of a larger reality. With the limitations of these questionable choices, however, the study aimed for the highest possible standards. In the countries that Keyes chose, his teams of researchers visited rural villages and selected middle-aged laborers. They measured body weight, blood pressure, and cholesterol levels in addition to surveying the men about diet and smoking habits. For um, a small subset of these men, samples of food they ate over a course of a week were collected and sent to labs for chemical analysis. Okay. Um, the seven country study results first appeared in a 211 page monograph published by the American Heart Association in 1970, followed by a book from Harvard University Press. Seven books and more than 600 articles by the various members of the original study team followed. By 2004, according to one tally, there had been close to one million references to the seven country studies in the, in the, in the medical literature. What Keyes found, as he had hoped, was a strong correlation between the consumption of saturated fat and death from heart disease. In Finland, where the men worked hard as lumberjacks and farmers, yet ate a daily diet high in dairy products and meat, deaths from heart disease was high, 992 men per 10,000 over the course of a decade. On Crete and Corfu, with plenty of olive oil and very little meat, the number was ridiculously low at nine. In Italy, the number was 290. Among railroad workers in the U.S., it was 570. Because Keyes had carefully standardized the diagnosis of heart attacks and other manifestations of coronary disease across countries, one of the greatest accomplishments of the seven countries data was simply to demonstrate that people living in different nations really did suffer vastly different rates of heart attacks. And for this reason, the, okay, so it, it, it demonstrated that, hold on, um, okay. So despite the celebrated results, there were some vexing problems with the data points, okay, that failed to support his hypothesis. For instance, the Eastern Finns died of heart disease at rates more than three times higher than the Western Finns, yet their lifestyles and diets, according to Key's data, were virtually identical. The islanders of Corfu ate even less saturated fat than did the countrymen on Crete, yet the Corfu rates of heart disease were far higher. Thus, within countries, the correlation between saturated fat and heart disease didn't hold up at all. Fifteen years later, in 1984, Keyes followed up with these populations in all seven countries and found that outcomes had become even more paradoxical. By then, the consumption of saturated fat could no longer explain differences in heart disease rates at all. Okay, hold on a minute. I'm going to go to the part where, he, where it's, hold on, there's a particular part that I'm looking for. Okay. Okay, in this study... 
The people who survived the longest overall lived in Greece and in the U.S., and their longevity showed no relationship to the amount of fat or saturated fat they ate, nor to the cholesterol levels in their blood. Um, hold on, I'm skipping to the... Hold on a minute. Okay. I found one of the most stunning and troubling errors in that country. Okay, wait. I looked more closely into the dietary data on Greece because it became the exemplar of the Mediterranean diet. Okay, this is what I've been looking for. And I found out that most stunning and troubling errors. In that country, Keyes had sampled the diets on Crete and Corfu more than once in different seasons in order to capture variations in food eaten. Yet, in an astonishing oversight, one of the three surveys on Crete fell during the 48-day fasting period of Lent, okay? So he's researching people's dietary habits during Lent, okay? How would this, how would this have affected the diet? The Greek Orthodox fast is a strict one and means abstaining from all foods of animal origin, including fish, cheese, eggs, and butter, wrote a contemporary observer. In Italy, the expression, I can't, I don't speak Italian. So in Italy, the expression pari corissima, it means he or she looks like Lent, okay? Has long referred to a person who is ugly, unpleasant, and thin from malnourishment, okay? Sounds like Sabi. Looks like Lent. Since the foods avoided during Lent are the principal sources of saturated fat, a sampling of the diet during this holiday would obviously undercount that nutrient. A study conducted on Crete in 2000 and 2001 showed that saturated fat consumption halved during Lent. Keyes did mention this problem in his monograph, but immediately excused it, saying that the strict adherence to Lent did not seem to be common. He gave no further details and made no mention at, of the issue at all in his main paper on the Greek diet. Later, when two researchers from the University of Crete tracked down the original directors of the Greek section of the seven country study, they were told that 60% of the study population in Crete was fasting during the survey. That's a problem, okay? Um, and no attempt was made in the study to differentiate between fasters and non-fasters. This was, quote, a remarkable and troublesome omission, end quote. The researchers wrote in Public Health and Nutrition in 2005. But that was 40 years too late to correct the study's original impressions. There's also more stuff in here about how, there's just a lot in here, okay. Um, but this is why this data that animal foods is bad and cholesterol is bad, it's coming from this bad research, right? That many people, many people have critiqued, okay? And, and I'm, I'm just picking like pieces in this book. This book is like 400 pages, right? Um, and it, it talks about where he published his data like, this, the data where he was like really telling the truth, he published it in like a Dutch, organ, a Dutch journal that he knew nobody would look at, right? So when he posted like the flawed um, stats, he posted in the prestigious journals. But then the times that he did post, you know, the truth, it would be in some journal that nobody reads, okay? So that's what this is basically saying as well. Also, the methods used to analyze the foods wasn't standardized. There's a lot of issues. So the thing is with scientific research, a lot of people don't understand you have to analyze studies. This is the reason why in the scientific community, when people do, um, do, do research, other scientists critique it. The, the media will just look at a blurb, publish it, and all the regular people in the world go with that. Nobody is analyzing how is this research done. You have to go look at the study and analyze how it's done because there's a lot of flawed research. And there's a lot of research that doesn't even say what people are claiming it says. But if you don't go look at it and read it, you won't understand. You won't know. And if you don't have a background in science, you probably won't even understand what the hell you're reading. So that's another thing. Right? Um, so, I mean, and then it just goes on to talk about sugar. How, you know, many scientists back then were talking about how sugar is really the problem. Sugar is really the cause of heart disease. Um, I mean, it's just, I, I could go on and on and on, okay. I've been reading this book for a minute. I had left it in the park in New York. I bought it again. I've been reading it. And a lot of this is stuff that I already know. And I've, I've been knowing for a long time. But um, 
I just felt like, you know what? I gotta start doing more book reviews. And I gotta read some excerpts from some of these books. And I gotta tell you guys, if you really want the truth, you really want the truth and good research, and you're really serious about taking care of your body, check out the books that I recommend. And use your critical thinking skills. Where do your people come from in the world? Is there anybody in your family who lived to be 90 plus? And if so, what did they eat? Were they eating salad all the time? I think it's a horrible thing to be raising vegan children. I don't think adults should be vegans. But if you're an adult and you decide to do that, you've already went through your developmental stages. So if you want to be in an eating disorder, starve yourself, you might be able to do that for a little longer and not mess yourself up as much. The kids are developing and growing. And when they don't have enough, it's not just protein, it's also fat, okay? And people always want to put animal foods in a protein category. It's the fat. It's the fat. Damn, this damn bee. It's the fat that I love so much. You people who follow me know I'm always talking about fat, okay? I eat lots of butter every day. Oh my God, I love cheese. Love raw milk, love cream, eggs, ice cream, all of that, right? And so people will see me and they'll be like, how do you get your body like that? Like, I don't eat salad. I eat bacon and eggs every day. I cook my eggs in bacon fat um, or duck fat or beef tallow. I eat grass-fed burgers, I make grass-fed steaks, I cook my fish covered in lots of butter and cream, like, that's how I eat. And I never once was a vegan or vegetarian. So, and it's funny because somebody I went to college with, a girl who I haven't spoken to, I mean, my freshman year of college was 1999. I haven't, I don't remember even hearing from this girl since 2000. She sent me a message on Facebook telling me, you know, your body is my goals. You still look exactly the same way you looked when you walked into our dorm room freshman year. And you know what? There was a time in my life when I used to eat McDonald's. You know, when I was in college, I ate ramen noodles. But when I was in college, I also ate lots of ice cream. And me and one of my really good friends who we had abs everybody wanted. We weren't doing crunches, but we didn't run track and we were dancers. Me and her used to eat so much ice cream all the time, and we would always joke that ice cream is a part of our recipe for our abs, right? And we used to joke about that. Now, skipping forward, it is, because I don't do a bunch of crunches, you know what I'm saying? But I do, I never was on a starvation diet. I never drank no damn vegan milk and all this other crap. People mess up their metabolisms with that. And, you know, like, fat-soluble vitamins are hormones. Like, vitamin D is a hormone, okay? It's made from cholesterol. So if you're on a low cholesterol diet, you have an issue producing vitamin D, you have an issue producing testosterone, which I'm sure most men do not want. For women, issues producing estrogen. You get into hormonal issues, thyroid issues, you know? I'm watching, I was watching um, this show, Married to Medicine, which I really like. Um, and I'm looking at Married to Medicine LA. And another freaking book. And, um, Everybody's depressed and got issues, and they're all on this low-fat diet. So I'm looking at this, um, this, this um, psychiatrist, you know, and she's having all these issues, but she, all she eats is raw vegetables. Like, you need animal fat for your brain. So um, my Instagram Live is going to run out in 1 minute and 42 seconds. So I've been talking to you guys for almost an hour. So I know this is a long, lengthy video. Be sure to check out other videos of mine on my YouTube page, The Body Scientist, because I know plenty of people who follow me for years, and they tell me, oh, I've been following you for years, but then I don't know. They ask me, what, what do you eat? And they think I'm a vegetarian. Or they're, I'm like, you obviously don't pay attention to what I post. If you look at the things I post on Instagram and read them, and you look at my YouTube videos, you will learn a lot, okay? And you will learn a lot of shit that a lot of people aren't telling you. There's a lot of people on the, on the internet, internet YouTube trainers and nutritionists with lots of a million followers posting these pretty pictures of salads and skinless chicken breasts all the time, and it's not healthy. To me, it's not just about looks. It's also about longevity and your long-term health, okay? So definitely, is your body your health. But if you want the truth and you're really serious about taking care of yourself, for sure, read what I post on my IG page. Check out the videos on my YouTube pages and check out the books that I recommend. I'm always available to work with clients from a distance, um, do consultations and stuff like that. So if you're interested, you can email me at thebodyscientist81 at gmail.com. Once again, my name is Michaela Valletta. Thanks for listening. If you learned something from this video, please share it, like it, because sharing is caring. Have a great day, people. <laughs> Bye.